Okay, good, good morning and uh, welcome to Leipzig, to the um, third All Hands meeting and uh, the first uh, Open Science Conference of Geobon. It's really wonderful to have uh, such a turnout. This is uh, more than twice as large as the previous All Hands meeting in Izulomar in 2012. And I think that tells a lot about the growth of Geobon as a network uh, since it started. Um, I and Mike are going to give you a brief introduction to what Geobon is about and what is the history of Geobon and where we are heading with this conference today. And um, to provide some context, um, I wanted to introduce you to some of the open questions that we have in biodiversity research. And many have argued that we are undergoing this six mass extinction. Biodiversity and ecologists have argued that for that for uh, biodiversity scientists and ecologists for over 40 years. And uh, that has um, uh, been um, uh, described in many research papers. And um, the idea not only that we have a major biodiversity crisis, where biodiversity is being lost very fast, but some colleagues go as far as to say that this is the beginning of a six mass extinction, the same size as the previous five mass extinctions that have wiped from the Earth 80% uh, of the species, up to 80% of the species. Now, a couple of years ago, two papers, uh, by the way, Marie Dornelas will be talking about her work tomorrow here, so you can talk to her about, about this um, tomorrow in person. Um, two papers have taken the scientific community by surprise, published in uh, Science and PNAS. And uh, they took the scientific community by surprise because people went to look at the trends in species richness in community uh, assemblages that they have been monitored over time, some as far as the beginning of the 20th century. And they also want to look at pl uh, plant plots, plant quadrants that were re revisited a few years later, a few decades later, and look at how species richness has changed in those plant plots. And to the surprise of everybody, they found that there was no trend on species richness, either in these um, community assemblages, um, many of um, based on uh, animal community assemblages, also plankton, some of them, but other the plant plots. So no, no detectable trend in species richness at the local scale. And so this, we are facing this paradox where some say we have this six mass extinction, this major catastrophe going on, and then when people have looked at trends in local species richness, people find that there is no detectable trend. How can you explain that paradox? What is happening? Now, this is one of the possible explanations is that there are a lot of spatial gaps in monitoring. These are not all the data points that went into the Dornelis study. Um, I guess uh, the sampling of the Dornelis study is very, even very different from this. These are the points that are in one of the largest population trends database in the world, that is the Living Planet Index. And uh, what you see is that many of the areas that are undergoing fast change um, that are marked here by red in this map, or even green, uh, in red is forest loss, in green is forest gain. You don't have any monitoring going on on that. And so you could argue that the sampling of these um, um, communities and of these plant plots are, are not really representing the areas where some of the fastest changes are happening. And, um, um, and, and, and this makes us to have a very incomplete view of what is happening to biodiversity change. So this is one possibility. Not only this is um, not 
stratifies according to where the fastest changes are happening, some of the areas with most biodiversity are the areas where we have fewer monitoring um, uh, projects or fewer, fewer monitoring programs. So we have really not a lot in the end, as in the previous map that I showed, or not a lot in the uh, Himalayas, or not a lot in Southeast Asia, or in the Afrotropics. We know very little about what's how biodiversity is changing those sites. And so, not only we have gaps in spatial monitoring, but also in the taxonomic monitoring. This is the distribution of um, species for the different groups um, of life. The dark green here is the proportion of those species that have been described. For instance, for uh, vertebrates, virtually, it is these tiny slides here, virtually all the species have been described, not virtually, but many species have been described. Most 90%, over 90% of the species have been described. Other groups like invertebrates, maybe less than 10% of the species have been described. Depends on which estimate of species richness you believe. And some of the most recent estimates say that maybe there, there may be not more than six to eight million species on the planet. But if you look at um, the species that are assessed, for instance, the red list, that is the longest running monitoring tool that we have developed by IUCN starting back in the 60s, where um, experts around the world come together to classify species according to the degree of threat regularly, what you see is that all, starting here to here, these are all vertebrates. This is just this tiny slice of life. That's what, you know, that's what is really represented in the IUCN uh, red list. And there has been a, a proposed ser several approaches to solve this problem. One is this sampled red list index that tries to address this issue. But it just says about what we understand of biodiversity change, and it's still very little. Now, this is why GeoBon is needed. And GeoBon is this idea that we could develop a global biodiversity observation network that contributes to the effective management of biodiversity and ecosystem services on Earth. And um, GeoBon is part of GEO, and GEO is this uh, global uh, coordinated, comprehensive, and sustaining system of serving systems, or has the goal of developing this system called GEOs. And GEO is an intergovernmental organization. Around 80 governments all over the world have uh, become member of GEO to develop this um, collaboration across countries in space observations. And the idea, of course, is that countries have borders, but Earth observations have not. And GEO just have undergone a major restructuring. GEO was created in 2005. Last year, celebrated 10 years, and there was a major restructuring. These are the new eight areas, what they call society benefit areas of GEO. And we are here in biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability. One of the nice things about this restructuring is that before biodiversity and ecosystems were separate things, what for many of us didn't make sense, and in the Neo Geo working plan, they are together under biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability, where GeoBone is. Now, let me tell you a bit about what is unique and what are the strengths of our network. And uh, first is that you know it's completely volunteer based. No one comes here because we have here a big pot of funding to award you, and you know we, we're funding you. That, this, that doesn't exist. Yeah. So. It's a completely volunteer-based network. And it's amazing that such for a volunteer-based network, we have been going for a long time, long term. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures showing how we started almost 10 years ago, in 2007, developing GeoBon. And GeoBon has persisted over these years, over different working groups and over different management and you know, by 2025, I bet that we'll still be here. Or not here, but somewhere else in the world, but the community will be here. 
It's an open community. Anyone can become a member of, uh, of Dearborn. If one of the things that we find, you can find in your bag is this biannual progress report of Dearborn. And there we have the five ways to get engaged with Dearborn. Either as a member uh, of the network overall, a member of working groups, joining a biodiversity observation network, becoming a national regional thematic bond, or becoming an associated partner if you are an organization. Anyone can participate. And this is really an important characteristic of GeoBond because openness is not only about participation, it's about everything that is done in GeoBond. It's about the papers that we publish. We, 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 we favor um, open access. The GeoBond handbook that is going to be published this year in Springer is going to be available in open access. Anyone can download the handbook. The data that is supposed to be developed under GeoBond auspice is supposed to be open access. The methods for indicators should be open access. Everything should be open and public under GeoBond. And those are also the, the guiding principles of GEO. We didn't invent them. GEO has these guiding principles. We just apply them to the biodiversity community. We also have a, a small secretariat to support operations. And um, you know, this meeting couldn't be possible without this team. And this currently, the secretariat is contributed by IDIV um, and uh, supported by the German Science Foundation. And this is what really keeps the network together. The secretariat is this glue that glues the network together. And from a very small budget of the secretariat, we have currently around, uh, this secretariat is run with a budget of 250,000 euros a year. We mobilize resources from the entire community that are almost um, uh, 50 times as large as that in terms of the in-kind contributions. We are mobilizing resources over, of over 10 million euros a year in, across the community. And of course, we are about biodiversity monitoring and biodiversity observations. That's what gets us here. And there is a strong emotional connection to this. Many of us are not only scientists, but are also emotionally connected to the need to save biodiversity on our planet. Now, I wanted to show you a bit of the early beginnings and a paper that I co-wrote with David Cooper uh, in 2006 in Trends in Ecology and Evolution, he already laid some of the ideas for what will you know, become Geobon. And David Cooper, uh, after it took 10 years to get David to one of these meetings. So finally, we're going to hear from David after 10 years of this paper. It's a big moment for us. Um, this is, uh, of course, a paper by uh, Bob and um, other colleagues. This is really where Geobond starts in 2007 with this paper, where Geobond starts to be designed. And this was the first ever meeting of, uh, of Geobond um, with a very small group of people in, 2000, uh, in uh, early 2008, in January 2008, at this beautiful me uh, building of the World Meteorological Organization. Um, sometimes I, 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 I joke with Mike that I, we have this dream of that we'll get a, a building for Geobond that is even be better or more beautiful than the WMO building. That is a beautiful building where this event take place, took place in 2008. And you see some faces, Georgina Mays here, yeah? We see Bob, we see Mark, and Larry Audry, that is now the Executive Secretary of IPVS. Uh, we see Norbert there, uh, Roger, Simon, many of the, Gary, yeah? Many of the faces that are still around were in that uh, early meeting. And of course, you know, I wanted to thank here Bob. Bob, where are you? Can you stand up? Bob Scholes. Yeah, Bob, uh, a round of applause because Bob really took this for the first, you know, seven years. And uh, yeah, so Bob had a really big role in the in 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 taking Geobarn from 2008 until 2014 was our first share 
where many of the conceptual issues of Geobon um, were developed. And uh, we had a, a several working groups. Um, these were the working groups that were created in early 2009 that went until uh, this meeting and they are about to be dissolved and new working groups will emerge from this meeting. So that's, uh, this is the um, still current structure but about to be dissolved. And um, we also had the all hands meetings. This is the second all hands meeting in Azilomar in California. Uh, many more of you uh, were, were there. And uh, in these meetings we did things like um, we, we wrote this implementation plan for the first uh, five years, 2010-2015, um, uh, um, uh, were, were prepared and developed at these all hands meetings. And there are many products of these meetings, the implementation plan, um, many other products, a, a very important report that was very well received by the CBD that was this uh, adequacy of existing biodiversity uh, observation systems to support the 2020 targets. This was a, a report that was published immediately after the IGE targets in 2010 were defined, and there was this uh, question, can we uh, monitor those targets? Yeah? Uh, what kind of data is there to monitor these very ambitious 20 targets for 2020? And uh, I still think this is w one of the best documents Geobond produced as a community. And, you know, from a a partnership where a few key and important players came together, and I want to really acknowledge NASA. NASA supported, and Woody Turner, um, that is also somewhere here, where is Woody? Woody, stand up, you know, Woody has to stand up. Woody really supported almost single-handedly Geobond for the first five years. So I also want to, all the, all the funding, all the funding, um, 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 Bob got funding for a small secretariat at CSIRO, uh, CSIR, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, Woody got funding for the All Hands meeting, and really uh, NASA had an instrumental role in kicking Geobon uh, out of the ground. And from this partnership, you know, we have many more partners, and it's continuing to grow and that uh, Geobon is becoming more and more global. Now, also, some new leadership came about in 2014, and, you know, we'll argue that uh, uh, younger and, you know, less hair, and uh, maybe not as attractive, but we do our best, and uh, we are here together. Um, so, a new governance structure also was brought by us. Uh, we, we created this advisory board that has a a, a role of providing guidance to Geobon, and that is composed of um, uh, representatives from institutions around the world and also uh, experts. And also, we created this implementation committee that is the working group leadership that, again, is a, about to be renovated, that is the executive body that takes the decisions on a daily to daily basis, on a regular basis, um, about the future of Geobon. The other thing we did when we started our mandate in 2014 was develop this uh, strategic, uh, three-year strategic plan, and um, uh, we identified two core activities um, to uh, develop. One was the essential biodiversity variables, this concept um, that Geobon developed, and also the buy in a box, this toolkit to provide uh, uh, countries with uh, instruments for developing their biodiversity preservation networks. And uh, we also, um, in this strategic plan, so my elements are covering this binaural progress report that you uh, have in your uh, 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 information packages. Um, we also uh, decided that we will have a lot of user engagement and uh, uh, invest a lot in communication and outreach. Um, and on developing regional and biodiversity restoration networks. Much of these ideas are now also underlining where we go from here and how we want to go into the next four years. So let me highlight some things we did with the, uh, over these uh, 
uh, last uh, two years, uh, we uh, developed a new website that most of you are uh, aware of, geobond.org. We have a regular newsletter that is reaching uh, over 500 people regularly. Um, we engage a lot with CBD and IPBS. Um, I think uh, David will tell you about how some of this engagement we did and how uh, the CBD is over time increasingly recognized um, geobond in, in its decisions. We have a seat. One of the things that people don't are, are not aware is that as a, um, as a representative of GEO at uh, the CBD and IPVS, we have a seat next to any other intergovernmental organization, such as uh, uh, IUCN. So we, we can speak on behalf of the community, and uh, we can uh, suggest changes in texts or suggest directions. Um, and uh, we provide this service to the uh, geobond community, including also nominating scientists to IPVS. We have nominated quite successfully uh, 26 scientists over the years to IPVS that are now coordinating lead authors or lead authors. So geobond has really um, become an active member at these intergovernmental um, activities. Um, and I think uh, the community should be aware that this Geobond Secretariat is here to help you, to represent you, and to help also improve biodiversity change monitoring across the world. And of course, this is not all. We are also, we have to get more and more engaged with the Biodiversity Indicator Partnership developed at UNEP WCMC that develops the indicators for the IG targets and developed indicators for 2010. We are increasingly connected to uh, Ramsar, uh, particularly with the, um, with the Global Wetland Observation System of Systems that is being developed. There will be several sessions here at the conference uh, uh, about that. And also the emerging, uh, well, not, uh, well, still emerging, let's say, Global Goals for Sustainable Development, the SDG goals, is something that we are increasingly paying attention to and where we have to connect. Some of them are explicitly linked to biodiversity. Okay, um, and we have many achievements over these uh, last uh, uh, two years and a half. Uh, one is the finally the book is about to come out. We'll have uh, this was uh, um, something we started working a few years ago, and if you recognize the photo on your badge, is also the cover of the book. And if you are wondering, uh, yes, it's an eye open a gecko that is the the. Uh, in this uh, cover. But there were other products, like um, something that Roger and his team had been working for many years on a new map of global ecological end units. Um, we organized some workshops uh, that produced uh, some um, documents to support the EBV development, such as the guidelines for standard butterfly monitoring. Uh, some cool work coming from the Ecosystem Services Working Group on how to monitor ecosystem services globally. Um, very interesting work also on how to monitor invasions based on the EBV framework um, and the Global Freshwater Biodiversity Atlas developed by um, Jörg Freyhoff and, and, and other colleagues. Um, these are some of the products. Mike, I turn to you. Thanks, Enrique. So, uh, so Enrique has really given us uh, an overview of what GeoBond is and where it's coming from, and uh, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about where we envision where we want to go. So, so with GeoBond, and you'll see this with the conference structure over the next two days, as well as the all hands workshop, we're really focusing on on what we call two streams or major themes for GeoBond. One is the essential biodiversity variables. Where's your laser on this? Is that the Oh, the red dot. So the EBVs sort of uh, act as a top-down framework for biodiversity observations. They, uh, they come from or are inspired by the essential climate variables, and they really can help us structure how we actually build observation networks. 
And through that, we also are focusing on a bottom-up construction process. So we're really taking the conceptual development of GeoBond and turning it into an operational network that's user-driven. And we've purposely picked uh, the CBD in particular as, as what we see as a key client for, for GeoBond in that uh, we need to be able to produce useful products and tools uh, and access to expertise so that we can start to build and fill those gaps that Enrique was uh, showing us. So as part of this, we're working in the other stream on building bonds, whether those are thematic bonds. So these bonds might be uh, irrespective of space, like the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. Uh, national bonds, we have a number in existence and others in development, and also regional bonds, such as the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program. And connecting the two is, is something we call Bond in the Box. So Bond in the Box is a, is a global toolkit that was led by uh, Columbia's Humboldt Institute. And essentially, it's a, a technology transfer and capacity building mechanism, recognizing that all of you in this room and many, many people around the world are continually building tools, tools for biodiversity observation, whether those are data collection protocols, data management systems, models, analyses, and reporting. And the idea here is that we need to be lazier in a way, and that we need to start sharing or creating a way that we can actually share tools, best use examples, so that we actually both lower the threshold for starting up bonds, as well as improve our interoperability, because of course we want a harmonized approach to how we monitor biodiversity and how we actually manage and output that data. So Bond in the Box uh, is in development. Uh, we have it on the site, and it really takes the, the EBV concept and the definitions and refinement of that and th through those working groups where they're building tools, whether it's models or data collection protocols, will be found in Bond in the Box, which then the bonds can operationalize. At the same time, the bonds at the bottom will contribute themselves to Bond in the Box. So we see it as a two-way conduit where we're really connecting users and developers. So the essential biodiversity variables, uh, this is, this is uh, them. There are six classes that are in development. And they sit between primary biodiversity observations and outputs, such as indicators. They're independent of measure. And again, it's a really a unifying concept around can we start to frame the key biodiversity dimensions and have a more structured approach on how we actually monitor biodiversity change. And there's been a lot of work done continually on the concept and further refining and, and, and developing it. And this is just one example of a paper that was just uh, produced in Nature, uh, led by Andrew Skidmore, who unfortunately can't be here this week, uh, on how EBVs can be applied uh, using remote sensing techniques. And we have a number of different modeled output indicators uh, that have been produced through uh, our modeling working group seven uh, around using the EBV concept to be able to model and infer change in species uh, based on changes in habitat, uh, such as the species habitat index and the biodiversity habitat index, model changes in uh, distribution of species over time based on climate change scenarios, and so on and so forth. So we're really taking the EBV concept and we want to bring it to ground and actually build useful tools for that. Uh, we'll also be launching this week uh, the EBV data portal. And, uh, and this, is, this has come out from many, many different requests uh, around can Geobon take the EBV concept and actually produce some useful outputs that the community can use. So in the portal right now, four of the six classes are represented. And there are global and, and regional data sets available that you can actually uh, get to download the metadata and the data around different things such as species population, occupancy, abundance, and so on and so forth. Now, getting into the bonds, I see our, our, our slides are a bit chopped. Um, we're really focusing on working with all of you in this room and many, many other people around the world to, to work together to actually build more operational biodiversity observation networks, whether those are thematic, regional, or national. And through that process, actually build up the Geobond network. Geobond started uh, from a, a small group of very passionate individuals, and now one of our challenges is to really grow the network and have as much representation from the different parts of the world as possible. And this is just a shot of a workshop we had in Columbia.
And this, this map just shows some of the regional and national bonds that, uh, that are connected formally to GeoBond. It doesn't say that these are the only bonds out there, of course. There's many, many biodiversity observation networks operating at subnational scales, national and regional scales. But these are some of the ones that we have formally connected. So this is the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program. We have a French bond in development. Uh, we have one in Colombia in development. We have a, a bond for China, as well as the Asia Pacific bond. And the idea here is that through our bond engagement process, we'd like to engage with existing and developing bonds in other parts of the world, endorse them, and bring them within the geobond community so that we can actually align them around the EBV principles and therefore allow us to aggregate up data and so on and so forth. The thematic bonds, these are just two examples. Uh, we have a global marine biodiversity observation network in development uh, led by a number of passionate individuals from around the world. And we also have, as already mentioned, the global wetland observing system, which is connected very much to Ramsar, and GeoBond plays a key role in building that system. We also have a global system for ecological observatories in development, as well as a global ecosystem services framework. So around developing bonds, this is, a, this is a framework that was developed by Philip Bubb, and Philip's with uh, UNEP's World Conservation Monitoring Center that really focuses on the different aspects or life cycle of biodiversity data. And when developing a bond, the most important thing in my mind is that we first think about what's the actual need or the irresistible pull for a biodiversity observation network. So what, are, what do the users want? We should be asking them first what kind of data they need to make decisions. And then based on that, we can actually design a framework. So the development process that we're using is uh, a nine-step process that we're applying. Uh, we used it in the Arctic, and we're now applying it uh, with our partners in Colombia. And this, we'll be presenting this uh, over the next two days, and we really appreciate some feedback on it. But it's really to build a very consistent, structured approach to biodiversity observation networks that are user-driven, build on conceptual frameworks and key questions and apply the EBVs in a structured way. And through this, we have these tags which actually we use in Bond in the Box. And these are the essential components of our biodiversity observation networks, the key questions and user needs, data collection protocols, data management systems, analysis and reporting tools. We're also, as mentioned, wanting to connect with existing bonds. And so we actually have on our website a process by which we can endorse existing biodiversity observation networks, uh, provided that they follow some, uh, some key criteria around data harmonization, availability, uh, discovery and products, uh, interactive, in interacting actively with GeoBond, uh, being part of the GeoBond network, and also very important that the bond has an authorizing environment. So it, this is a key step that sometimes bonds miss, where a, a bond builds up from a grassroots level, but a government or a regional entity has never actually asked for it. It's very difficult to sustain those bonds over time. And uh, we'll be hearing about this later today, but Bond in the Box, again, led by the Humboldt Institute. You can see this essentially as a technology transfer capacity building toolkit uh, where you'll be able to find uh, the best use uh, data collection tools, observation, design, uh, data management and analysis and so on within this so that we can actually make it easy for organizations, agencies, groups and regions to build their own observation system by taking the state-of-the-art tools that are out there. So going into this conference uh, over the next two days, the conference, as already mentioned, really is focusing on exploring the latest ideas, the advances, the challenges and solutions around biodiversity observation science. It's a really exciting opportunity to really learn from all of you about how we can actually improve on how we observe biodiversity change and how we actually can build networks. And the All Hands workshops flows out of that so that both the All Hands and the conference reflect the two streams approach around the EBVs and the biodiversity observation networks. And the All Hands workshops are essentially there to chart the course for GeoBond for the next three years. As Enrique mentioned, this is an open network and we need to build this together. It's not us up here telling you what to do, and you don't want that, because we don't always know what we want to do, but we really want the community to actually build this together. So our vision is that by 2025, GeoBond is a robust, extensive, and interoperable 
Global Biodiversity Observation Network. The observations are derived from this network are contributing to effective and timely conservation, sustainable use, and mitigation and adaptation decisions regarding the world's ecosystems, the biodiversity that support, and the services provided. So that's a long-winded way of basically saying we want to work together to build a more coherent, powerful system that's actually relevant to decision makers around biodiversity observations. So looking at everyone around the room, we have uh, 255 participants in this conference uh, and the All Hands meeting representing 40 con countries. And this is a huge milestone for Geobone. There's many people that I do know in this room, but there's probably more that I don't know that I look forward to meet, simply because we need to actually do more to engage many, many different parts of the world. And this is a real key step for us. Now, the, the, the management committee or secretariat is, is, is made up of, of Enrique and I, of course, but also Jörg Freyhoff, who's our executive director, Leticia Navarro, uh, Gary Geller, who's at the Geo Secretariat right now, Ariana Korn, Helen Mathy, Carlos Guerrera, Guerra, <laughs> Miguel Fernandez, and Christian Langer. And it's worth, uh, I think, uh, having all of them, these, these ones stand up for a round of applause because these folks did the heavy lifting on this workshop and have put it all together as a huge amount of work. So if, if, if those folks that are in the room could stand up, it'd be great. Some of them are not in the room. Someone's there. They're all working. Okay, well, Leticia's there. <laughs> But if anything goes wrong, you can blame Enrique and I. <laughs> so thanks very much.